Joe Rogan Podcast, check it out. The Joe Rogan Experience. Train by day, Joe Rogan Podcast by night, all day. Ladies and gentlemen, coming at you live from paradise. I'm in Hawaii right now. And uh, I was gonna, I was gonna watch the Bisping fight, the Bisping Kelvin Gastelum fight live, and uh, do like sort of a breakdown of it while it was happening. But the shit was going on at like two o'clock in the morning out here, and it wasn't happening. I have been eating like a pig and drinking. I've been doing vacation type shit. I, I'm, I'm a strong believer. And that you need to do vacation time. Like vacation time is important. You can't just be working all the time. Occasionally, you have to just fuck off. And so that's what I've been doing. I've just been fucking off. So I I was tired and I decided I am not going to stay up late. And so I watched it in the morning. I watched it this morning and I, I've got a couple thoughts on it. First of all. Um, Brendan Chobb said this on his Instagram, and I could not agree more. I don't think you should be allowed to fight three weeks after you have a brutal fight like Michael Bisping did with GSP. He got rocked. He got choked unconscious. And then three weeks later, he's fighting a really dangerous Young and up and coming Kelvin Gastelum. And Kelvin is a beast. He's got nasty boxing. And uh, that is what he showed in that fight. He hit him with a, a beautiful straight right jab and a right hand behind it. And oh my goodness. It was just, he, that kid is just on fire. He's, he's just on another level right now. I'm, I'm super, super impressed with Kelvin. Kelvin has got lightning fast hands. And he's, he's an interesting guy because. He's what I would call a tweener. And what that means is that I don't – I mean I think Kelvin in in the best best of times. Like if, if Kelvin has the best camp and the, the best performance, it's entirely possible that he could beat anybody at 185 pounds. But should he be at 185 pounds? Boy, I don't know because – Chris Weidman is at 185 pounds, and when Chris Weidman got Kelvin to the ground, it really did look like you're talking about two completely different weight classes. And Chris Weidman was able to choke Kelvin out, and obviously Weidman is a former champion, and there is absolutely no shame in losing to Chris Weidman. But it's just the way um, it looked when you were watching the fight. To me, it looked like two different weight classes. And... um, there's a lot of people that think that really Kelvin should be fighting at 170 pounds if he got the proper diet, and he was doing that for a while. Uh, it was, at one point in time, he was uh, – I know Dolce was working with him for a while, and uh, he had his diet in line, and he, he looked fantastic. And then, you know, just things happened, and he didn't want to pay the Dolce money, and uh, – I don't know who he's working with right now as a nutritionist, but I just uh, – I think he's a phenomenal fighter. I just don't know if 185 pounds is is the right weight class for him. It could be. I mean it could be that maybe what he really needs to do is just lose some body fat, put on some muscle, and maybe 185 pounds will be his weight class. It's just that constant debate of whether or not you should weaken your body – and drop down to the minimum weight you can or whether or not you should fight at a natural weight and have a healthy body. It's, it's a real good argument, and I'm, I'm pausing right now because I'm pulling something up. Uh, there's a girl that just died in Australia. Uh, she died um, very recently. Uh, she was preparing for a Muay Thai fight, and it's just... It's just part of what this sport is about. Unfortunately, it, it really bothers the fucking shit out of me. I think it's the scariest thing. Uh, I think, um, yeah, here it is. Teenager dies training. <sighs> here it is. Um, the the girl's name. She was 18 years old, and uh, her name was Jessica Lindsay, and she died while she was cutting weight. She was an amateur kickboxer in Australia. Um, I cut weight a bunch of times when I was doing Taekwondo tournaments, and uh, it is brutal. 
it's it's terrible. I mean, I was bad at it too. I didn't do it correctly. I just worked out real hard the night before and wore rubber suits and the whole deal and dehydrated myself and I didn't rehydrate myself well either. So I I felt like shit the next day when I was fighting. And uh, a lot of wrestlers back in the day used to do the same thing. Um, my weight cut though was nowhere near as extreme as some of the MMA fighters do. Some MMA fighters, I mean, they're getting on death's door. And uh, I just I just think it's uh, one of the most disturbing and uh, un- most unfortunate aspects of MMA. Uh, Kevin Lee said before his last fight with Tony Ferguson that, you know, he felt like he was, he was dying when he was cutting weight. And he made the weight. Habib Nurmagomedov, who's the, if not the best, one of the very best lightweights in the world, um, undefeated, had his body shut down last time he tried to make the weight and couldn't make the Tony Ferguson fight. They they pulled him out and took him to the hospital. I mean, I'm I'm beating on a dead horse here because it's something that everybody knows. Everybody's aware that it's a it's a terrible terrible aspect of our sport and in my mind it's contrary to what martial arts is supposed to be about so in that sense i encourage kelvin to stay at 185 pounds because obviously the guy's knocked out vitor belford at 185 he just knocked out uh former champion michael bisping at 185 pounds i mean he could knock out anybody at 185 but a guy like chris weidman who's very smart about cutting weight he cuts a lot of weight, but he does it the right way, rehydrates the right way, and he's just a fucking beast. He's just so much bigger. And when he got Kelvin to the ground and submitted him with a head and arm choke, boy, it just really seemed like that's the wrong weight class for Kelvin. And then you see Kelvin, ne- next fight, fights Bisbing and just fucking lights him up in the first round. Now, would he have been able to do that if he fought the Bisping that was training for George St. Pierre? I mean, if... Bisping did not have the George St. Pierre fight and just went right into the Kelvin Gastelum fight. Would the same result have happened? It could very well have. The way Kelvin hits, he's fast as fuck. His hands are beautiful. He throws really crisp, straight punches. And in this sport, it's, there's not a whole lot of guys who have crisper, sharper hands at 185 pounds than Kelvin. I mean, he just has beautiful head movement in boxing, and when he moves in for the kill with those hands, whoa! I mean, you saw in the Vitor Belfort fight. I mean, he just fucked Vitor up with those straight punches. And he throws them efficiently, and they have snap to them, and just... And on top of that, he's a very good wrestler. I mean, a lot of people forget how good his wrestling skills are on top of all that. He's just a real threat at 185 pounds. Fascinating thing. Uh, Because... it's just such a wide open division. He just called out um, Robert Whitaker, who's the interim champion, of course, and uh, called out Whitaker and wants Whitaker to uh, to fight him next. But of course, Robert Whitaker is uh, waiting for the big payday. I would too if I was him to fight George Saint Pierre. So it's uh, it's a wide open division now that Saint Pierre choked out Michael Bisping. And then Kelvin just lights up Bisping. And, of course, you've got to think that Weidman is still in the mix. I mean, even though Weidman lost to Yoel Romero and then lost to Gegard Mousasi, he's still in the mix. Uh, He was winning that Yoel Romero fight, in my opinion, until he got caught with that wicked flying knee. But that's the danger of fighting Yoel Romero. Yoel Romero could do that to anybody in the world. He's just such a fucking freak athlete. Uh, so really, really wide open division. I'm bummed as fuck that Gegard went over and uh, decided to uh, fight for Bellator. But I get it. You know, I mean, these guys got to go where all the money is. And at Bellator, he easily could be a champion. I think he could be a champion in the UFC as well. And maybe we will see him in the UFC again. I mean, he could easily fight a year or two over in the UFC and then come back over. Gegard is still relatively young. Uh, but it's nice to have competition. I think competition is good for everybody, and I think it. Uh, I think it really elevates the sport. It elevates the level of the sport, I, and it, you can see by the results that a lot of these UFC fighters are having 
um, especially Lorenz Larkin, who is very good. He's a very, very good striker. He loses to Lima in a bid for the title and then loses by knockout to the always dangerous Paul Daly. So I think Bellator and now, especially in that 170-pound division, you've got Rory McDonald. Bellator is really showing they have absolute world championship caliber, caliber talent over there. So to get back to that fight, uh, I agree entirely with uh, – to get back to the Bisping and uh, Kelvin Gastelum fight, I agree 100% with what Brendan Schaub said that you really have to protect a fighter from themselves. You really can't be letting a guy fight three weeks after an absolutely brutal fight like that. It just does not make sense. It just does not make sense. Um, I don't think it's smart. I mean, I understand the UFC needed someone to fill in and short notice because Anderson Silva tested positive for performance-enhancing drugs, and they did not want to lose the uh, Shanghai main event. So... It turns into an even bigger fight when you've got the former middleweight champion right off of his loss three weeks later fighting again. But it's just not smart. I know Bisping wanted to do it. I know Bisping would probably do it again if you asked him to do it. If you you asked Bisping to fight in a couple weeks, he'd probably probably do it again. And and, um, someone was talking about him fighting in England, I believe in March, which – Boy, I mean, that's less crazy, but still crazy, right? Because uh, we're basically in into December. So you got December, January, February, three months off, really, and then March. But, of course, during that time, he's going to be sparring. And, you know, you know Bisping. He's a fucking animal. He's not going to train easy. He's not going to take much time off. And uh, there's a lot of debate as to how much time a fighter should be forced to take off after they get knocked out. And here's the thing about that. You're, you're seeing guys when they're fighting and you're seeing them getting knocked out and you're seeing them fighting, you know, X amount of months later. So you saw Bisping. He didn't get knocked out by George St. Pierre, but he certainly got rocked with that left hook. And then uh, he got choked out when he was on the ground. Now, for people who don't know a lot about MMA, getting choked out is not nearly as bad as getting knocked out. It's, there's almost nothing to it. The way to look at it is if you look at a garden hose and you know how you can bend a garden hose and cramp it down and it stops the water from coming out, that's exactly what happens to your fucking brain <laughs> when you get choked out. When you get choked out, it's basically cutting off the blood to your brain. You wake up and you're fine. You don't have memory issues. You don't have balance issues for the most part, especially if you've only been out for a couple of seconds. Um, it happens all of the time in training. Uh, I've seen many, many guys get choked unconscious. I've choked people unconscious. They come back and they're fine. It's not that big of a deal. But you got to realize before he got choked unconscious, he got hit with a big fucking left hand and hurt. And it was a great fight before that. Uh, both guys were, were giving and taking. Fighters need time off after fights. So you're seeing that, right? You're seeing the actual competition between George St. Pierre and Michael Bisping. What were you not seeing is how many times he got hit during training. Did he get rocked ever? Did he get clipped and dropped? Uh, Did he get dropped and hurt and take a couple days off and then get back to training again? Only he knows, only his camp knows, and most of the times they're not talking. But you hear about it all the time. As a matter of fact, I was talking to Forrest Griffin once, and Forrest was telling me that before he fought Anderson Silva – He was knocked unconscious twice in training. That's fucking crazy. I mean, here he is about to fight the greatest pound-for-pound fighter of all time next to – I mean, there's 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 three guys in that debate, right? My my number one guy right now is Mighty Mouse. I think just he he represents the highest skill level. But does he represent the highest competition level in terms of like the guys he's faced? I don't think so. I think number one competition level is John Jones. John Jones has choked out Lyoto Machida, Rampage Jackson. He's beat Rashad Evans. He beat Alexander Gustafson. He beat Glover Teixeira. He beat Vitor Belfort. He beat Daniel Cormier twice. I mean, fuck. He's beaten everybody. I think you look at competition-wise, John Jones is a very strong argument for the greatest of all time. But Anderson Silva's 
fucking right there too, man. Anderson Silva in his prime, I think, when you look at the way he knocked out Vitor Belfort with that front kick to the face, when you look at the way he fought Forrest Griffin in, in that fight that we were just talking about and, and KO'd him like a magician, the way he fought Stefan Bonner and literally put his back up against the cage. And again, Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin, they're just uh, – no disrespect – they're not at the same level as uh, Lyoto Machida or Glover Teixeira or some of the guys that John Jones has faced. But it's the way Anderson beat them. I mean, Anderson was just in his prime. He was a fucking master, like a real master. Uh, so Forrest Griffin fighting Anderson Silva after being KO'd twice in training camp is just insane. These are the things that fighters do when they have to do them. You know, you're talking about a giant payday. You're talking about a big fight. You give the guy a chance. Like, do you want to fight? Do you think you could fight? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I could do it. I could do it. And they go out there and they're compromised and they get clipped and you see it immediately sometimes. Sometimes you see guys, they get clipped and you don't know why. I mean, they get hit with something. And look, at any, any time when a, a person is throwing a punch or a kick at you and it connects, it can put you out. But there's no doubt at all, no doubt about it, that the resiliency of a fighter after they've been KO'd is compromised. There's just no doubt about it. When you see a guy who's been KO'd and then you see them get hit weeks, months later, they cannot take a shot the same way. Their brain is still recovering. Their body is still recovering from the concussion. And uh, you, you have to figure out a way to balance being a risk taker and seizing an opportunity, which is a huge opportunity, versus concentrating on having a long and healthy career. Now, that said, for Michael Bisping, he's kind of at the end of his career. I mean, he said essentially that he wants to fight one more time in England, which would be beautiful for him. And I hope they give him uh, you know, a good matchup. So it'll be a good fight for the fans. And I hope they give Michael some time off. Like, you know, Give the man some time to really relax and then go through a real nice three, four-month training camp, get in excellent shape, and give his best effort for one more go at it. I would like to see that. But it might be the hardest shit in the world to talk a fighter into retiring or to, for a fighter to figure out when to retire. I was just talking to Matt Brown. Um, he came to see me in Denver, and I was telling him, I was like, dude, that fight that you had with Diego Sanchez, what a perfect way to go out. Beautiful, spectacular knockout, classic Matt Brown fight, just blood and guts. He's one of my all-time favorite fighters to watch, for sure, because he's so fucking ferocious. You knew when you were going to go to see a Matt Brown fight, if Matt Brown was fighting anybody, win, lose, or draw, that guy – was going to have to face hell. Matt Brown would bring it in the ferocity, intensity that that guy would bring inside the octagon. It was just unrivaled. And the thing about Matt is he's, he's not like an unbelievably physically gifted guy. He's not like some Kevin Randleman character. Or, you know, there's been guys that are just physical freaks. You know, Anthony Rumble Johnson. There's, uh, you know, Brock Lesnar. There's, there's guys that are just physically, they're just freakish. They can do things that are just incredibly unusual. And then there's guys that their mind is just unbreakable. They're just a fucking warrior to the core, down to the cells. That's Matt Brown. And Matt Brown can lose. He's lost before. But he just loses because his body gives out. It's never because his mind gives out. I mean, that guy is coming to fucking kill you every time he gets into that octagon. And I love that about him. I mean, it's one of my all-time favorite fighters to watch for sure. And when I was telling him, uh, congratulations. I mean, it's an amazing way to cap off a career. He's like, ah, it might not be the last one. So he's still, you know, even after going through all those wars, you know, he's in his 30s now. I believe he's like 35, I think he is. Maybe 36. And, you know, still wondering, I think he's 36, still wondering, like, is this it? Do I do one more? Do I do one more? One more. Because the thrill that you experience, I mean, obviously I've never fought inside the octagon, so I'm just guessing. But the thrill of just fighting in general, it's such a, a much higher level of 
danger and excitement than most people experience in everyday life. And it's incredibly addictive. And it makes regular life seem dull and gray in comparison. When those guys get into the octagon, when a guy like Matt Brown smashes an elbow down on Diego Sanchez and Diego slumps and goes limp and the crowd goes insane. And, you know, when just when Matt got into the octagon, there's a, a crazy video of the fight while we're watching the fight. Matt steps into the octagon, steps through the cage, and fucking roars. I mean, roars. Like, you see it in his face. You see it in his eyes. He just opens his mouth and screams. That motherfucker was there to fight. That's what he loves to do. And it was finally there. It was finally happening. Gets through the training camp, steps into that octagon. It's go time. That is as exciting as life is going to be for him or for, for any combat sports athlete and it is incredibly incredibly hard to give that up once you've experienced that man i mean you see it in these guys it's so hard for them to know when to walk away but i think it's incredibly critical to balance out the glory of combat sports the glory of giving your all and going out on your shield sometimes and sometimes winning with vicious knockout or incredible submission, but knowing when the body has taken enough, knowing when your vehicle is damaged to the point where you should not be engaging in competition anymore. And it's different for everybody, and it's so hard to figure out when. And some guys just know. Some guys just know, and they go, you know what? I'm good. That's it. Uh, I don't feel it anymore. I'm going to step away. Um, TJ Grant's a good example of that. Here's a guy that was supposed to be fighting for the title. He was about to fight for the UFC lightweight title, and nobody ever heard from him again. He was suffering from concussion syndrome. He just had a real hard time recovering from a concussion that he got in training and uh, never fought again. Took a regular job. He's done some training, training fighters and stuff, but never decided to get back into the octagon again. Uh, Chris Holdsworth's another example. Got a training injury, got hit in the head in training real bad, got a concussion, and um, decided to stop. And that was it. Very hard for these guys to figure out when. So um, next Saturday, December 2nd, there's a big fight. It's a rematch between Max Holloway and Jose Aldo. You also have Alistair Overeem and Francis Ngannou on that card. Woo! Henry Cejudo and Sergio Pettis. Eddie Alvarez and Justin Gagey. Woo! Just those four fights right there. Holy shit. Holy shit. I know uh, I talked about Holloway versus Aldo before. Um, What I like about this fight... First of all, the first fight was very good until Aldo um, ran out of gas and Holloway took over. Um, Aldo's camp was saying that going into that fight, Aldo had a leg injury, which kind of makes sense because he really didn't throw many leg kicks. But he also didn't throw very many leg kicks against Frankie Edgar. I think the strategy for them for that fight, though, was that he was worried about the takedowns of Frankie Edgar. So he had decided to avoid being taken down. One of the best ways to do it would be just to avoid kicking and just outbox him. And he did that very well in that fight and won a pretty clear, unanimous decision. This is going to be a different fighter. I mean, Max Holloway is in his prime. He beat Aldo the first time around. And he's incredibly confident that he's going to be able to beat Aldo the second time. Aldo, though, said that he had this leg injury and it prevented him from throwing leg kicks, but that it's better now. And that's one of the reasons why he's excited about fighting Holloway again. Now, um, if that is the case and if Aldo is in tremendous shape because he took this fight on relatively short notice, he did not get uh, a full two, three month training camp. I think it was five weeks out, maybe more. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm wrong about that. I'm not looking at it right in front of me, but I know it wasn't a full camp because I know it was supposed to be Frankie Edgar. Edgar got injured, and so Aldo steps in. So we're going to find out. We're going to find out if Aldo can make the proper adjustments and whether or not the ability to throw leg kicks is going to make a difference because Aldo's leg kicks classically in history have been some of the very best in the game. If you look at his fight with Uriah Faber, it's one of the very best uses. Uses? 
best use of leg kicks maybe in the featherweight division ever and just smashed Uriah Faber's leg to the point where, I mean, it's one of the all-time grossest injuries in MMA. Uriah's left leg was like twice the size of his right leg and had to do a bunch of crazy therapy to recover from it, including hyperbaric chamber. And, you know, he documented it. Uriah's, he's such a cool dude. He's, uh, I love that he did this. He, he documented a lot of the injury online to show everybody, like, look how fucked up my leg is. And, uh, that's Aldo at his best. Uh, is Aldo the same guy now? I mean, he's gone through 29 professional MMA fights at the highest level. He's been a champion for a long time. And, you know, he's had some wars. The second fight with Chad Mendez was a war. Of course, he got stopped quick by Conor McGregor. The fight with Max Holloway was a war. I mean, he's been through some some really tough fights. Does he still have that same level? You know, we really don't know. And we're going to find out. Hopefully, we're going to find out from an in shape. I mean, I don't know what kind of camp he was involved in, like how hard he was training, rather, before uh, he entered into camp for this championship fight. I'm hoping that he was in good shape, and that's one of the reasons why he was so eager to take the fight. And we're going to find out. We're going to find out Saturday night, and that's very interesting. But maybe even more interesting is Alistair Overeem and Francis Ngannou. Because... Alistair Overeem is one of the most experienced guys in the division, of course. Overeem is the former Dream Heavyweight Champion, former Strike Force Heavyweight Champion, and former K1 Grand Prix Champion. One of the very best kickboxers to ever fight in MMA, without a doubt. But you want to talk about a guy who has been in wars. Like, let's Google Alistair Overeem's overall record because it's got to be fucking crazy as far as the uh, number of times he's been stopped I mean it's really fucking bananas let's go and look we'll first look at his MMA career we'll count this up and this is no disrespect to him I'm a huge Alistair Overeem fan and I'm not saying that he should retire or anything crazy like that but let's just take a look at how many times he's been stopped just in MMA Okay, so he won two fights in a row. Uh, Fantastic victory over Mark Hunt. He KO'd him with knees and won a split decision over Fabricio Verdum. Um, Or actually, a majority decision. One one of the referees, I guess, call or one of the judges called it a draw. I thought that that was a very close decision, but I thought that Verdum was going to get the nod. Quite honestly, let's look at the the times he's lost though. Stipe Miocic. When he fought for the title, knocked him out, okay? Before that, Ben Rothwell knocked him out. Before that, Travis Brown knocked him out. Before that, Antonio Bigfoot Silva knocked him out. Brutal knockout. So that's just within the last four years in the UFC, he suffered four brutal knockouts. Before that, Sergey Karatonov knocked him out. Brutal knockout in 2007, 10 years ago. Mauricio Shogun Hua knocked him out also in 2007. Uh, he lost to Ricardo Arona. He got um, stopped in that fight. He tapped uh, to strikes. Uh, Hogerio Noguera uh, stopped him. Little Nog stopped him. Uh, his corner stopped it. by It's a TKO. That was in 2006. He got stopped by Fabricio Verdun, but that was a Kimura. That was a submission. Um Shogun Hua stopped him uh, the first time in 2005. So Shogun knocked him out twice. He TKO'd him in 2005 and KO'd him in 2007. Before that, Little Nog beat him by decision. Chuck Liddell KO'd him in a fantastic fight where Overeem was really coming on strong against Chuck. And then uh, Chuck caught him with some brutal punches and KO'd him. That was in 2003. Before that, Bobby Hoffman. A lot of people forgot about Bobby Hoffman. Way back in rings. um, KO'd him in 2000. And that's it for MMA. So just MMA KOs, right? The first KO loss, we have Bobby Hoffman. Then we have Chuck Liddell. Then we have Shogun. Then we have uh, Little Nog. 
then we have Arona, then we have Shogun again, then we have Karatanov. Okay, we already have seven. That's Karatanov. Then we have Bigfoot Silva, eight, Travis Brown, nine, Ben Rothwell, ten, Stipe Miocic, eleven. Eleven stoppage losses in MMA. I mean, holy fucking shit. That's crazy. 11 knockout or stoppage losses in MMA. Then you go to kickboxing. Badr Hari stopped him in the K1 Grand Prix final in 2009. He stopped him. Um, he got stopped by Globe Fetosa in um, Kyokushin versus K1 in 2004. He got KO'd. He got stopped by Bernard Paris in K1 Holland. That's in 2001. So one, two, three KO losses in kickboxing on top of all the other MMA losses. That's a lot of fucking stoppage losses, folks. And it's led people to question the durability of the current guy. But what we do know is that Alistair is extremely crafty. And one of the things that I like about Alistair these days is since he's gone over to uh, Jackson and Winklejohn in Albuquerque, he has become much more elusive, um, much slicker on his feet, moves around a lot more, and doesn't just try to smash people. The Uberim, the guy that we saw fight, Brock Lesnar when in his UFC debut. That was like classic Uber Reem, just jacked to the tits, smashing people, running through people. He would meet force with greater force. Now what you're seeing is – what you're seeing is the Alistair Overeem that fought Junior Dos Santos who fought an incredibly clever fight, moved around well. Um, he was very, very slick, very difficult to hit. And then started scoring on Junior and then eventually caught him with a beautiful left hook and KO'd him. That's, that to me is the interesting Andre Arlovsky is t- today. A guy who realizes that perhaps he can't take a punch like he did when he was younger. You know, he's been in a lot of really, really tough fights as we just went over. And realizes like, hey, now I have to be smart. Now I have to be clever, I have to move around a lot, I have to use my skills. And his skills are substantial. In my opinion, he's the best, I mean, right up there with Mark Hunt, of course, um, who he just beat. The best heavyweight kickboxer ever. When it comes to credentials, he's the best heavyweight kickboxer ever in MMA. Really, uh, no, no heavyweight kickboxer other than him and Hunt have ever won the K-1 Grand Prix. And Hunt won it, he stepped into the finals as an alternate. He had lost earlier that night. Uh, not to take anything away from Hunt, because of course Mark Hunt is still just one of the the all time greats when it comes to kickboxing. But when Mark Hunt won, um, he won. We can go to, the, to that record right here. Mark Hunt won um, the the K one Grand Prix. He won it. He had lost that night. Mm, see, see, he's he's fought the K one Grand Prix a couple of times. He lost to Semi Schilt. Uh, he got uh, TKO'd by a spinning back kick, and he won. Um, well, he's God damn, he's fought a lot of fucking awesome kickboxing fights too. So he lost to Ray Cepho in 2001 in the semifinals, and then he won that night. He beat Stefan Leko. So he lost to Ray Cepho. Ray Cepho apparently couldn't continue, and then he came back to win. If I'm getting that right, yeah. Looks like he beat Stefan Leko in the uh, semifinal. Well, it says semifinals. It says wins K1 Grand Prix Championship 2001. Oh, okay. He fought Francisco Filio, but that was in, I'm looking at a different date. That was in uh, 2002 or 2001. He beat Fielder. Anyway, I'm rambling. Did you notice? Yeah, I'm talking too much. Uh, but so he's fighting Francis Francis Ngano. and Francis Ngano, who is right now 10 and one in the UFC, 
10, uh, 10 won with uh, zero draws, so 10 wins, and it's just been smashing everybody. And if he looked at his uh, last fight against Andre Arlovsky, that was a fight where it was like probably one of the first fights where we really got tested. We really got to see what happens when he fights a former champion, a former really world-class fighter. And uh, it was a good test, but now a bigger test is in front of him when he's going to fight Alistair Overeem. I mean, we've seen him so far four times inside the octagon. Uh, he stopped Curtis Blades by knockout. He stopped Bohan. I don't know how to say this guy's name again. Mihaivich. Mihaivich? I don't I remember how to get <laughs> Bojan Mihaivich. I do not remember how to say homeboy's name. Um, then he stopped Anthony Hamilton. Uh, by submission, showing that he has submission skills as well. And then, of course, just knocked out Andre Arlovsky in his last fight. It's a very interesting fight because the the question is, is Ngannou ready for a guy who's got the skills of Alistair over him? The skill, the experience at the highest level, the craftiness. Is he going to set traps? And is Francis Ngannou going to be, fall for those traps? The other question is, can all can Alistair Overeem take a shot from Ngano? Ngano has legitimate, absolute one punch knockout power, extreme confidence, and he's fresh and in his prime right now. Actually, entering his prime. I mean, arguably, he hasn't even reached his prime yet because Ngano is one of those guys that, at 31 years of age, is near his physical prime, but he's still learning. He's still getting better at the sport and. As he fights better and better competition, you're going to see more of his skills shine. You're going to see where, where the holes are in his game, and you're going to see how he responds to adversity. Hopefully, we're going to get a chance to see all those things in this fight. Um, if Overeem wins, there's a very good argument for him being next in line to fight Stipe Miocic. The real question about the heavyweight division, the real question other than um, you know who's next for Stipe, the real question is, the health of Cain Velasquez. Cain Velasquez, in my opinion, is without a doubt one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. Um, he's just a force of nature when he's in shape. When you when you see the Cain Velasquez that beat Ben Rothwell, when you see the Cain Velasquez that just stormed the division, when you see him in um, the second and third fight with Junior Dos Santos, that Cain Velasquez is a fucking monster. The question is, after all the surgeries, back surgery, knee surgery, shoulder surgery, can he come back and be that guy again? Um, as a fan, I most certainly hope he can, but we're really not going to know. Um, another fight on the card that's very interesting is Henry Cejudo and Sergio Pettis. Sergio Pettis is the younger brother of Showtime Pettis, Anthony Pettis, who is the former lightweight champion. And Henry Cejudo, of course, is a former Olympic gold medalist, the number two ranked flyweight in the world. And Henry is coming off of an absolutely spectacular KO uh, of Wilson Hayes. I was blown away by him in that fight. In that fight, he looked like some sort of a karate master. I mean, that was a, it was a very, very interesting fight. Before that, he lost to Benavidez. And Benavidez, of course, one of the most experienced, one of the best guys in the division. And he lost a very, very close fight, uh, a fight where I've talked to his coaches afterwards, and they were really pissed off by the decision. They, they thought Cejudo could have gotten the nod. But he rebounded, and he rebounded versus Wilson Hayes and looked like a completely different fighter. The thing that excites me about this fight is two things. One, the potential of Sergio Pettis. Sergio Pettis is a young kid. He's one of the youngest guys in the division. He's the extremely talented younger brother of another extremely talented fighter. So he's had martial arts in his life, you know, most of the time growing up. He's 24 years old now. He trains under the great Duke Rufus, who in, in my opinion is one of the very best guys in the division. In terms of um, his uh, ability to coach fighters, he's fucking fantastic. Doof, not the d- d- division. I mean, I should say in the in in the sport. Uh, Duke Rufus is just an amazing striking coach. He's a former world Muay Thai champion himself, outstanding kickboxer, and extremely knowledgeable 
about both kickboxing and MMA and one of the best guys in the world at training kickboxers for MMA. I mean, he's just fantastic. And what we've seen from young Sergio, we saw him get um, submitted by Alex Caceres early on in his career. Um, and Alex is uh, just slicker and caught him on the ground. And uh, and then we saw him lose again to Ryan Benoit. I, I think that these losses, especially for a young fighter, are absolutely critical. I think you find out what you're really made of you, and you see what you need to improve upon. And in fighting tough guys early on, like Alex Caceres, like Ryan Benoit, I mean, and we're talking about two years ago, he fought Benoit. He was 21 years old then. So, or 22 years old, he's 24 now. So he's a really young kid, still learning, still growing on the job, and uh, has looked fantastic in his last few fights. Looked really good against John Moraga, and looked even better against Brandon Moreno in his last fight, which was a five-round unanimous decision victory. So this, in my opinion, is going to be the toughest fight of his career, because Henry Cejudo just has that Olympic gold medal winner mindset. The the mindset of a guy like Cejudo, I mean, this guy is focused on being a champion 24 hours a day. And if you look at the way he fought against Wilson Hayes, I mean, if he, if that's indicative of the kind of improvement that this guy can make, and Kieran Fitzgibbons, who um, is uh, another fucking phenomenal Muay Thai coach, he told me that this kid is just a sponge and just can learn so fast at a ridiculous weight. And I think you're looking at athletic prowess in Henry Cejudo, but I think maybe perhaps more important than that, you're looking at his mind. His mind is just ultra sharp and focused and, and determined, and he's just got that championship mindset. I mean, that's why he is an Olympic gold medalist in wrestling. So he's got unparalleled wrestling skill in the division. And then on top of that, if you look at the Wilson Hayes fight, you look at radical improvements in his striking and movement. I mean, he looked like a combination of a prime Leoto Machida and Conor McGregor versus uh, with his movement against Wilson Hayes. I think a lot of guys are realizing that that karate style, if you have all those other bases covered, if you have great wrestling, if you have submissions, good takedown defense and good boxing skills, as well as Muay Thai, everything else, that karate stance, that sideways stance that we see employed all the time by Wonderboy Thompson, that we see um, um, we see a, a bunch of different fighters. Of course, Leota Machida, a bunch of different fighters use that stance inside the octagon. Uh, Conor McGregor, it's a very difficult stance to deal with. It's a, If you're good at it, if you're good at that movement, that in-and-out, side-to-side movement, uh, Michael Venom Page has a very unusual take on that. Uh, fighting in Bellator, he likes to fight like that too. And, of course, he's a um, former point-fighting champion. That style is fucking hard to deal with. It's really hard for guys to judge. And if you're dealing with a guy like Cejudo who's lightning fast on top of that, and starts moving like that with those world-class wrestling skills, with excellent striking, um, you know, classic striking, boxing, kickboxing. Very difficult to deal with. I'm very interested to see what style he takes uh, or how he approaches this fight with Sergio Pettis. Uh, he's quite a bit older than Sergio, uh, being 30. Um, that's a really interesting fight. Um, I'm very curious. I, j- I just do not know how that one's going to play out. One fight that I don't know how to is going to play out, but I'm fucking beyond pumped for it, is Eddie Alvarez and Justin Gagey. Justin Gagey is a fucking savage. And so is Eddie Alvarez. Eddie Alvarez is a beast. And I think a lot of people are looking past Alvarez. You know, Alvarez had just come off of that brutal knockout loss, uh, Kind of a humiliating knockout loss to um, Conor McGregor. And then after that, he is involved in the the no contest uh, versus um, Dustin Poirier. I believe that was an eye poke. Um, that is, I'm trying to remember how that fight went down, but I do not. I feel like someone got poked in the eye. Uh 
Either way, it's a no contest. So that obviously doesn't move him up the ladder any, and he's got to uh, regroup. Yeah, no contest. Here it is. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. This was a... Okay, now I remember what it was. It wasn't an eye poke. It was a knee to a downed opponent. And it was a fucking phenomenal fight while it played out against Dustin Poirier. They were going back and forth. Now I remember the fight. And um, Poirier had Alvarez in some deep trouble. And Alvarez rebounded. And Alvarez, I believe, hit Dustin Poirier with a knee while he was down. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. And interesting. Yeah, see, this is what happened. Poirier, um, Alvarez, you know, Herb Dean was defending it, saying that Alvarez didn't intentionally knee Poirier. And if I remember the fight... It was a crazy war. Uh, Alvarez had been rocked. Poirier had been rocked. Poirier was bloodied. And um, Alvarez hit him with an unintentional knee um, that could have resulted in a disqualification win for Poirier. And Poirier was saying that he looked at it as a win, which is uh, interesting. Um, so anyway, Poirier re- rebounded from that fight obviously, and uh, stopped Anthony Pettis in his last fight. So that the division is just crazy and unbelievably hot right now. Um, and everybody waiting to see what the fuck happens with Conor McGregor rebounding. But Eddie Alvarez, with the no contest, and before that, the KO loss to Conor McGregor, desperately needs a win. And he's coming in there against one of the most fucking savage guys in the division. Justin Gagey showed in that Michael Johnson fight what he's made of. And a lot of people were very excited to see him inside the octagon. He had been fighting in the World Series of Fighting and looking like an absolute monster. But against what a lot of people thought was just not the same caliber of competition as the UFC offered. And so they wanted to see what would happen if he fought a real world-class fighter. And what we saw in the Michael Johnson fight is a Justin Gagey who fights... Uh, I don't want to say reckless, but he puts himself in danger. And it's one of the things that makes him so exciting. He forces his will on people. He's a ferocious striker and uh, an excellent wrestler as well and just fucking puts it on fighters. He tests their will. He puts tremendous pressure on fighters. And the, the fight with Michael Johnson was just a pleasure to watch. Just so much fun and so fucking crazy. There was so much chaos in that fight. And a lot of people were introduced to Justin Gaethje from that fight. The hardcore fans had known him already from the World Series of Fighting and had heard about him through the internet. But the the UFC fans and uh, the people that were watching that night, they really got a chance to be treated to just the kind of chaotic fight that is really going to bring like a, 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 the casual fan when they see a guy like Justin Gagey fight, it's really going to make you uh, a fan of this kid. Just his style. It's just, there's very few guys. I mean, other than, I mean, uh, Matt Brown, who I talked about before, but even Matt Brown is capable of winning so many different ways. Whereas Gagey, He's going to probably try to knock you out or get – I mean he's even said himself that he might get knocked out. You're probably going to see me get knocked out, he said, uh, over the next few years. He's got that mindset, this kill or be killed mindset. And uh, it's just absolutely fascinating to see this kid compete inside the octagon because he's so fucking crazy. Because he's such a fucking animal inside the octagon. He just got this uh, – undeniable killer instinct and indomitable spirit and just there's levels to this game there's levels physically and he's at a very high level physically but there's also levels mentally and that's what excites me about Justin Gagey is his the the mental level he just has zero quit in him and he's a hundred percent ferocious 
So him fighting a fucking animal like Eddie Alvarez, that's just a recipe for a good time. And we're going to get to see that. And we're going to get to see that next Saturday night live on pay-per-view. Woo! So how long we've been doing this here? 49 minutes. Boy, I can fucking talk a lot, huh? So uh, also on the undercard, here's another fight that's a big fight. Um, This is uh, Charles Oliveira versus Paul Felder. Paul Felder continues to impress. I'll tell you what. Paul Felder is a fucking phenomenal uh, commentary guy too. He he did commentary guy? Color commentator. He did a fantastic job doing um, commentary for uh, Dana White's Tuesday night fight show. And uh, his cont- the Tuesday Night Contenders show. And uh, he's done some uh, UFC events now as well. And just excellent. Great enthusiasm. Very knowledgeable. Great talker. Smart, articulate guy. And he's fighting Charles Oliveira Saturday night. Now, Charles Oliveira is a guy who has had mixed success inside the octagon. At his best, he's been incredible. And he shows a, a great range of very technical striking and very, very solid Brazilian jiu-jitsu. But he's had some tough losses. The, the KO loss to Cub Swanson. Um, his, he burst onto the scene with a, an amazing victory. Um, way, way back in the day. See, this is not even... Uh, Efrain Escudero uh, was his second fight inside the octagon, actually. And he got him by standing rear naked choke. That was a big fight because Efrain Escudero had won the ultimate fighter. And it was just... It was a big victory for him. And he went down. He lost to Cowboy Cerrone. Um, he got uh, KO'd in the first round. He uh, lost to Jim Miller. He got submitted. And then the Cub Swanson KO. He got beat up by Frankie Edgar in a very fun fight. Uh, Three-round unanimous unanimous decision. Then uh, Max Holloway put it on him and stopped him in the first round. Then uh, Anthony Pettis submitted him. So he's had some some ups and downs. Ricardo Lamas KO'd him. Uh, Excuse me. Ricardo Lamas finished him by submission in the second round. So... He beat Will Brooks by submission in the first round of his last fight and got back on track. Looked excellent in that fight and fought that fight. You know, it was like it was a real do or die fight for him against Will Brooks, a guy who was coming over from Bellator, a guy who was very talented, and uh, Oliveira wound up submitting him. That was a big victory for him. And in my opinion, this is one of the most dangerous fights for him right now at this stage of his career because Paul Felder is a fucking killer. He's an animal. He's very, very strong physically. He's a big 155 pounder, whereas Oliveira is a smaller 155 pounder, a guy who's fought at 145 before, but just really had a hard time making that weight. Um, Felder's going to have a, a power and strength advantage, and Oliveira is going to have to be crafty. And in my opinion, his best way to win this fight is to get this fight to the ground. Um, and that's going to be a tall order, a very tall order. Um, Felder is just a, a very aggressive, very durable, and extremely aggressive guy at 155 pounds. Can I say aggressive one more time? Um, I really loved his fight against um, – well, he's got had some um, amazing fights inside the octagon. But what, what I liked – I liked his fight against – I like his fight against Barboza because – the Barboza fight showed him against one of the very best strikers in the division, and he got outstruck. He lost that fight, but he was in it every second of the fight, and he was trying to win up until the very end. Um, he's had some ups and downs inside the octagon, but he, he's won two in a row, both by knockout, both in the first round. And um, the Barboza fight and the Ross Pearson fight – were two decision losses that he got, a uh, split decision against Ross Pearson. He beat Danny Castillo in a spectacular spinning back fist knockout. Um, Jason Sago before that. I mean, and the Barboza fight, I think, was just a good example of like where this guy's heart is at. Fought against one of the best and fastest strikers in the division and was in it to the end. It was a real learning experience for him. And that was uh, also a fight of the night. So I think Felder at this stage of his career is really coming into his own. I don't think he's in his prime yet. I think uh, 
at 33 years of age, we're starting to see the very best of him. And he's, he's got an incredibly bright future. But also, you got to realize at 33 years of age, you kind of got to get after it right now. I mean, this is the time for him. And uh, for Oliveira, Oliveira's got to capitalize on that victory that he just had over Will Brooks. And, you know, he's a little bit younger at 28 and still got massive potential and an incredible amount of experience for a guy who's uh, 28 years old. So this fucking card is just stacked. This card is stacked from top to bottom. I mean, you've got um, Cowboy Oliveira versus Yancey Medeiros is on that fight. And David Tamer is on that fight fight card as well against Drakkar Close. Now, that's a fucking sleeper. That's the big sleeper fight there because David Tamer is a fucking vicious striker. I mean, real world class striker. And he's only 28 years old. And David Tamer really let everybody know what the fuck is up when he fought Lando Venata. A lot of people had no idea who he was uh, up until that fight, even though he had won two fights in a row by KO in the octagon. Um, when you got to see that kid compete uh, against a, a really talented striker like Lando Venata and just outstrike him every step of the way, you really got to see how good he is. And again, at 28 years of age, I don't think we've seen the best of him yet. I think he is uh, he has just got a massive, massive amount of potential. And that's the fight that I think is the big sleeper fight on this card. That a lot of people are just, you know, not quite aware of it. And the guy he's fighting, Drakkar Close, 8-0 with one draw and very fucking dangerous fighter as well. You know, he's coming from two victories in a row uh, in the UFC. And uh, this will be his, probably his most dangerous fight against Tamer. Tamer is just a wild, fast, dynamic striker with legit world-class kickboxing Muay Thai skills. Very, very fun card. So that's going to be next Saturday night. Also, Tisha Torres is going to be fighting the Karate Heidi. Heidi? Karate Hottie? (laughs) Michelle Watterson? That should be a fun fight as well. Tisha Torres, who's uh, an outstanding striker, and Michelle Watterson, who uh, employs a lot of that karate style as well that we're talking about, that sideways sideways stance. She's got good kickboxing skills as well, good submission skills, and uh, Tisha Torres is going to most likely try to keep this fight on the feet. This should be a lot of fun. I mean... um, Michelle lost her last fight to Rose Namajunas, but uh, she beat Paige Van Zandt by submission before that in uh, a very, very impressive fight. Uh, Angela Magana, she beat her by submission before that. And Jessica Panay, she beat her in Invicta uh, by decision before that. Uh, and, you know, she's, uh, she's got a lot of hype behind her. One, because of she's got a unique style. She's fighting out of... Jackson's uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and she's also a very beautiful young lady. And, of course, people like that. That's a very interesting fight. Um, The whole card, this is like a great card from top to bottom. It should be a lot of fun. But, again, the sleeper fight, like I said, is uh, David Tamer and Jakar Close. Keep an eye on Tamer. That motherfucker is wild. Uh, Oliveira versus Felder should be a lot of fun. Alvarez versus Gage. You do not go to the bathroom. Do not get popcorn while that fight is going on. As long as it lasts, that fight will be chaos. Um, I think Cejudo versus Pettis is going to be a very interesting test to see where Pettis is at this stage of his career and to see if Cejudo can continue to show these massive jumps and leaps of improvement that he showed in his last fight against Wilson Hayes. The Overeem and Gano fight, fucking A, man. That could be chaos. I am interested to see whether or not Francis and Gano can catch Alistair Overeem or whether or not he finds himself against a guy who's far too crafty for him at this stage of his career. I mean, we really don't know. Um, he fought Arlovsky in his last fight, but with all due respect, I do not believe that Arlovsky is in the same category as Overeem. I think Overeem represents another level of danger. And on top of that, Overeem has a very good ground game that a lot of people are forgetting about. Overeem won the Abu Dhabi European Trials. He submitted Vitor Belfort. I mean, Overeem has legitimate submission skills. Submitted Mark Hunt. Overeem can submit guys. He's got good wrestling skills as well. 
you got to remember, he took Stefan Struve to the ground with a beautiful takedown that TKO'd him when he got him to the ground. Um, he may choose to try to take Francis Ngannou to the ground. We might, we might see that. We don't know. Um, it's just it's a very interesting fight to see where Ngannou is at this stage of his career and the biggest test of his career so far. And a fight that Overeem was looking for. Overeem believes that he has the skills to put Ngannou in his place and reestablish himself as the number one contender in the heavyweight division. That makes, uh, that makes me very happy to see that fight. I'm very pumped. And then, of course, for all the marbles in the featherweight division, Max Holloway versus Jose motherfucking Aldo for the title. You know, with a guy like Aldo, you got to remember, you're talking about a guy who is the best ever at featherweight for a long fucking time. You're talking about a guy that, up until that Conor McGregor fight, had beaten everybody that they put in front of him. He rebounded fantastic from that fight with the Frankie Edgar fight, then got beat down by Max Holloway. I want to see where he's at right now. I want to see whether or not he can rebound. And I want to see, after 29 professional MMA fights at the highest level, at 31 years of age, does he still have what it takes to fight at a world championship level? And can he come back better than ever? Now, with Max Holloway, he is, he's a fucking killer. Max Holloway has everything you want to see in a champion, a championship's mindset. And the way he wanted to go down at 25 years of age, too, I mean, just keeps getting better. He's not even near his prime. The way he wanted to go down to Brazil and beat Jose Aldo in Rio, and the way he said it, that he wanted to fight him in his country, then that, and that's what kings do. They go to the other person's kingdom and take their throne. And that's what he did. Very exciting fight. So I'm fucking pumped for next Saturday night. Um, Now, to answer some of the criticisms and questions, a lot of people have been saying, hey, man, you should probably do this with guests. I am absolutely going to do this with guests. The only reason why I didn't do this one with a guest is because I'm in Hawaii, bitch. I'm on vacation. And I felt like I owed everybody one because I just said I was going to do one of these things every week. But the next one I do, I will bring in a guest. And I'm going to bring in – I'm going to try to bring in more fighters. Um, I think this is the best way, I think, to do a fighter podcast. Not just – I mean I'm definitely going to do more – like where I just sit down, do a regular podcast with them for you know the JRE podcast. But when it comes to just a straight MMA podcast, I'm going to do um, quite a few of these, bring guys in. Bring some guys in that are interesting that I don't think uh, maybe um, maybe some of you folks have never heard talk before. So that will be cool. Um, I'm also going to ask – questions or uh, have you guys ask questions so what i'm going to do is um for the next one i'm going to put a post up on instagram and allow you guys and gals and non-binary folks to put um how long do we have to say that for non-binary how how many of you are out there that are non-binary is it really important to address you do you feel left out if i don't humans i'm going to allow all of you humans to uh ask questions and we'll uh, pick some good ones and throw those out there as well in the podcast. So that's it for now. Uh, next week, I got, I got some good guests this week. I've got some really fucking funny people. Um, I have C.T. Fletcher, who's uh, – I'm sure he's funny, but he's also a powerlifting legend. He's going to be here. Um, Owen Smith, the guy that I've been telling you folks about, who's, in my opinion, one of the funniest motherfuckers on the planet Earth, and a guy people are sleeping on. People just don't know how good Owen Smith is. He'll be here. Um, Brian Callen will be here this week. I got a lot of good guests this week. So that's it for now, friends. And um, thank you for tuning in to episode two of the J-R-E-M-M-A show, and uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. Okay? All right. Bye-bye.